welcome to the Chez Toi podcast on Paris Underground Radio. I'm Emily Monaco, fungus expert and professional consumer of cheese. And I'm your resident wine expert, Caroline Connor. And we both live in France, where wine and cheese are cornerstones of almost every meal, from the day-to-day to the extraordinary. At Chez Toi, we feature recipes submitted by home cooks like you and pair them with the perfect wine and the most complimentary cheese. This week's recipe comes to us from Shwita Manoaran, a one-pot pasta with vegetables. Hello, I'm Shweta Manoharan. I'm an Indian currently living in France. As we all know that Indian cuisine has a vast variety of regional specialities, thanks to the abundance of spices in India. And I'm from a city called Pondicherry from South India. Pondicherry consists a mix of Indian and French, given the history of outpost until 20th century. So coming to my part of the story, I always had food cravings since I was young and I wanted to eat tasty food. And I was lucky too because my mom, she is a very good cook. She used to say that if you want to eat tasty food, you need to learn how to cook it. So I always watched and learned when she cooks. I was asked to say what inspired this recipe. I say people inspire me to cook. I love sharing tasty recipes with my friends and dear ones, expecting nothing but for their appreciation. This is one pot pasta with vegetable of our choices. I've added mushrooms and zucchini, which is my choice. You can add eggplant, broccoli, or whatever you like. Water vegetables gives a good flavor and taste to this recipe. I hope you will like this and share your comments. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Shwita, for that recipe. And I think that we can both agree that half the fun of cooking is in sharing it with the people around you. And I think she really hits the nail on the head there. And that's kind of at the core of what we wanted to do with this podcast, which is take a simple dish like this one pot pasta and pair it with wine and with cheese and turn it into something even even better, right? Absolutely. And, you know, that is what food is all about, right? It's about love, Exactly. It is all about love. (laughs) So obviously, I was thinking when it comes to cheese, so often you're going to put cheese on top of pasta. But if we're taking the French approach here, which I'm going to try and do, the cheese is always going to come after the main and before the dessert if you decide to choose one. I sort of was thinking with this cheese pairing as something that goes after the pasta, you shouldn't be completely stunning your palate and being like, what the hell is going on? But you should kind of be thinking in the same logic and almost building up to like a crescendo of like, this was the pasta that we had first. It's got all these veggies. It's got this chili. It's got kind of this like Indian vibe, which I'm really into. And I was thinking, okay, when I think of the dairy that you get in Indian food, obviously you get like paneer and some of the curries, but I was thinking, no, with the double chili in the pasta from the chili paste and the chili powder, I was thinking more of like a yogurt raita vibe when I was thinking about the cheese, right? Because like if you've got all that power from the chili, the whole point of the yogurt is so that you can retain your your face. Right? It's like a little cool down. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So I was thinking like you have so many of those cheeses that are like super creamy and super luscious and you get that hint of kind of lactic sourness that you get in like a really good yogurt. And so that was kind of the vibe that I was looking for when I was thinking about cheese. Not a sprinkling on top, but something to kind of finish it off, end the chili heat on your palate, like really put it to bed and prepare you for if you're going to have a dessert that comes next. Ooh, I like that. So tell me. Okay. So here's, so I, I, there's a lot of like really creamy cheeses that you get in France. And so obviously that didn't, that was a big wide sector of what we could do. But she does use mushrooms in the pasta. And that made me think, okay, we have this whole category of French cheeses that we say have mushroomy aromas. Mm -hmm. And those are the bloomy rinded category. So that's like the Brie Camembert family. Perfect. And we call them bloomy because in French, we have this poetic reference to them as the flower rinded cheeses, the bloom, the flower. Let's get real. It's a fungus, right? The word in French for fungus is... Champignon. Champignon, exactly. And in France, we don't divide between like the champignon. I know this is, you know what? Fungus gets a bad rep, but fungus can be freaking delicious. 
But in France, the same word, <laughs> the same word for the fungus that like grows in your bathroom shower is the word <laughs> you use for a mushroom. Hey, look, I'm here for mushrooms of all sorts. I think right? it's great. I think that once everything is extinct, mushrooms are the next big thing, you know? Yeah, mushrooms and cockroaches, right? No, I'm They're going to eat all our plastic. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They're going to eat all our plastic and take over the world. It's going to be great. So all here for a mushroom. For sure. Um, <laughs> and so... <laughs> So the way that they make these like bloomy rinded cheeses, it actually, if you look at like an unfinished camembert under a microscope, it's really cool. It's kind of weird. It's got like a forest of what looks like tiny enoki mushrooms growing on the outside. And that's what makes like that downy kind of rind on the outside of those cheeses. That's crazy. I know. And I was thinking, okay, so we have this like really well-known brie and camembert and they're like super oozy and they like get all over your cheese board and that's phenomenal. It's kind of sexy. But for me... A brie isn't even creamy enough for this dish because brie and camembert ooze not because of their cream content, but because of their water content. For brie, it's only like 20% fat. I don't think that's enough fat to sort of cut the heat in the pasta. Oh, definitely not. So definitely not. It's this dish is very healthy. So yeah, let's let's change that. Let's change it. <laughs> let's make it. Let's let's add something. To it. Yeah. And so brie and camembert have this cousin that come from champagne. And I think that that would work really nicely here. And it's this cheese that we have called Chaours. So Chaours looks kind of like a really stocky camembert. It's only about four inches wide. It's kind of like a cylinder. It's really dense and almost like fudgy inside. So to give you an idea. I don't think I've had it. Okay, you have to try it. Okay. Because if you take a brie, like a typical brie, like 20% fat, Chaours is 50% fat. It's like yes. halfway between cheese and butter. So what, okay, I'm familiar with, what's the triple cream from Burgundy that's really famous that everyone's obsessed with? Brie Severin. Yeah. I'm, so is it like that? Yeah. So it's similar to a Brie Severin or similar, like if you're in the States to a double, triple cream Brie, except that most Brie Severin, not all, but most of it is made with pasteurized milk and Chaours is made with raw milk, which means that you get even more like kind of funkiness, almost that yeah. hay aroma, right? I love it. And then you get this butterness, like a little bit of the lactic kind of tang to it. And then you get – it ages in this cool way where if you get like a properly aged one, the inside is going to be like almost as dense as a super – like a Vermont goat cheese, like really creamy and intense. And then right between the mushroomy rind and the inside, you're going to get this fine line of that brie ooze. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. And then you get that same kind of mushroomy undergrowth forest flavor that you get on all the bloomies. And so I think that combo of the rich, creamy milkiness and the mushroominess is going to be perfect to go with, as you said, a pasta that is almost criminally healthy. Like let's <laughs> add let's add some some really good fat here. So that's kind of what I was thinking. Well, that sounds amazing to me. Awesome. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Marie, should I find an apartment before I move to Paris? Well, um what's a tenant file and a guarantor? Do I need them? Depends. I just bought an apartment. What should I do with it? Congratulations. Something to think about our... Is it better to rent my apartment furnished or unfurnished? How do I set my rental rates? Gail, these are all great questions, but the answers may not be so simple. Perhaps it's better to tune into our new podcast, Paris Instead of Mine. Oh, that's a great idea. I'm Gail Boisclair. And I'm Marie Pistinier. Between us, we have more than 35 years of experience in real estate and rental services. Listen in as we answer all your burning queries. You can even submit your own questions for us to answer. Paris, a state of mind. Mondays on Paris Underground Radio. What bra are you wearing right now? Whether you're smiling from ear to ear because you love your bra, or whether you winced because you're wearing, yet again, something you'd rather not, tune into Paris Undressed, the podcast that goes behind the scenes of the lingerie capital of the world. Hi, I'm Kate Kemp Griffin, author and host of Paris Undressed. From boudoir to the street, we'll explore the art of making and wearing French lingerie. We'll meet the designers and brands shaping our bodies and talk to fascinating people about femininity, sensuality, and sexuality. We'll share bra stories, secrets, desires, hopes, and dreams. This is the ultimate special occasion. 
So put on your favorite bra and tune into Paris Undressed, Tuesdays on Paris Underground Radio. And now, back to Chez Toi. I don't know what you were thinking for the wine to go with this dish. What what inspires you here? Well, I was thinking of this as being a weeknight meal that's really, like we said, healthy and about sharing and something you make a lot of. And so I thought a Cote de Rhone would be perfect. Cote de Rhone is from the Southern Rhone generally. It's going to be a blend of Grenache, Syrah, Merved, maybe Carignan, Senso, mostly Grenache. These are pretty light and fruity reds that are made to be drunk young. They are, you know, have a lot of sort of red fruit character and often can have a really herbaceous thing. And they have this character that we call Garrigue, which is actually refers to the sort of undergrowth, scrubby brushiness down there. If you go down around Avignon, Marseille, uh, above Marseille, over by Nîmes, you know, there's just this like lavender and, and wild rosemary and thyme and those kind of herbs. And the wine really does absorb those aromas. And so Cote de Rhone is, is really classic. And I thought with the oregano and the coriander that that would be really nice. And also, you know, there's kind of a ratatouille vibe going on here, which is also, you know, a dish from this part of France. So Cote de Rhone is such a great wine for a crowd because it's cheap and everybody likes it and it's consistent. This is a wine that is always my go-to to recommend. If you don't know anything about wine and you need to bring a bottle of wine to a party, you don't want to spend too much money, you bring Cote de Rhone. Amazing. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about what it's like to try and pair a wine with tomatoes because I've heard that's a really hard pairing to do well. Oh, I mean, honestly, I think people talk a lot about hard pairings and people okay. talk about <laughs> asparagus being hard to pair and artichokes. I'm like, whatever, people. You are causing problems that don't exist, telling stories. Tomatoes, look, tomatoes have sweetness. They have, they have acidity. They have bitterness if they have, you know, in the seeds and the skin. So that means that they're complex, which can be complex to pair with wine. You always want your wine to be sharper than your food. Ooh, okay. You know, you want a wine with some acidity, but, you know, most red wines are going to have pretty decent acidity. A Cote de should have decent acidity. I really don't think it's it's a problem here, but one reason why Italian wines obviously go, you know, pair very well with tomato is because they have a lot of acidity. But I, I'm not worried about that. I don't I don't think that that's something super important to worry about. I think for me, pairing it's it's also about the context and the moment. It's not just about the dish. And so for a, a meal like this, which is about sharing and friends and family and you know making a lot of it and and almost and I really do think this kind of weeknight vibe. You know, I'm not going to be here and tell you to go spend 60 euros on a Barolo, right? Right. So if we're talking Cote de Rhone, A, you said it's not something that necessarily has to be aged that long. And B, it's not going to be like super expensive. No, it's cheap. How young are we talking? Like how how young can you go? Well, so Cote de Rhone is going to be made to be drunk now. So what, it takes a year to make wine, a, a year and a half. So right now we're probably even on some 2020s, 2019, 2020, when a winery makes a Cote de Rhone, it doesn't necessarily mean it's crappy. It, it, it means that they're making a wine in a style that is fresh and fruity and made to be drunk now. So they're probably not going to put it in new oak barrels. They're not going to use their the most premium parcels. Often a winemaker, for example, someone in you know more prestigious appellation like Gigondas, they will make a Gigondas and they'll also make a Cote de Rhone because you want to have tiers of quality in your business. It makes sense. And Cote de Rhone is, is a really great, just easy drinking red. It's, it's medium, light bodied. It's fruity. It's herby. They can vary a lot in, in texture. They can be weightier. They can have more tannins. Usually they're not going to have a ton of tannins. They're just made in this really light, you know, light and easy style. But again, this is also from a place that's very hot. So there's plenty of booze and that gives you some texture too, but they, they're never expensive. I mean, in France, they're, they're pretty cheap, really. Like you can get a decent Cote de Rhone for like six euros. If you spend 10 euros on a Cote de Rhone, it should be damn good. This is like an awesome vibe for this whole meal because it's like a quick pasta that you can make a ton of. Yeah. It's like a, a young wine that you can drink a ton of. 
And then it's this actually relatively young cheese too that you can, well, you can, I can eat a ton of it. I feel like <laughs> a shawos, it, it's four inches. Like you can eat half of one by yourself <laughs> if you really want to. And I have commitment to a personal sized cheese myself. I like that. But I do wonder, so Shaours and Cote d'Aron, what are you thinking? Like, yeah. how, how do you feel like they're going to play? Honestly, I am a big fan of having more than one bottle open, especially if you have a crowd. Yeah. You know, there's no reason to have one, only one bottle open. And so I think for the Shaours, I would probably stick with white wine. And honestly, white wine would go really well with the pasta too. I think white white wine and tomatoes can, can be really nice. And you know what? I mean, you said this is from, it's from Chablis, you said? It's from Champagne. Oh, it's from Champagne. Okay. Let's see. I mean, you could always have Champagne with it. I'm sure that'd be amazing. I'm sure that would be <laughs> amazing. But I mean, Chablis. Chablis would be great. Chablis is generally going to be an unoaked Chardonnay. It's always going to be Chardonnay and mostly unoaked. Very minerally. That's what it's really known for. Really crisp. Does have some nice texture, but it's still definitely more on the, uh, you know, sharp side. Mm -hmm. And that would be, I'm sure, is a fantastic pairing. You know, I tend to think that white wine goes better with cheese. Okay. And I totally agree with you. And this is one of my pet peeves. Actually, you've kind of talked about two things that I think are major pet peeves with wine and cheese pairing is in France, a lot of people, they're going to open another bottle, but they're going to open another bottle that's sort of bigger than what they were already drinking rather than think about what's going to go well with the food that they're eating. And so you get a lot of people drinking these like bold red wines that they were eating with like their beef bourguignon or whatever, <laughs> drinking these with these super delicate, delicious cheeses because the cheese in France comes second. And so I feel like we in the States are often drinking red wine with cheese and not really thinking about it. We're so often, you can take a second and open a bottle of white, like a Chablis or a Champagne or whatever it is that you want to have, and have that with your cheese. And it's almost like what I was saying about having the Chablis to kind of cut the spice in your mouth from the pasta. Like you can have some wine with your cheese to transition your palate towards the sweet thing, which is going to be your dessert. Absolutely. I mean, also, I mean, I, I really do. Th I think the red wine and cheese thing is really prevalent, unfortunately, and it's I'm sure something we'll talk about a lot, but. I can say that I'm not super into wine pairing rules, but something that, that is real is you don't want the wine to overwhelm your food and you don't want your food to overwhelm your wine. And cheese and wine pairing is actually one of the harder things to pair because cheese is also really complex, you know? And so that's why I generally think your safest bet with any cheese is going to be a neutral white like a Chablis. Chardonnay, unoaked Chardonnay is going to be is going to be good with everything because it's not going to fight with anything. Right. And you have enough body with the Chardonnay to kind of stand up to a cheese that might have a little bit more personality, like, you know, assertiveness mm -hmm. without, like you say, like you kind of want everybody to be, you want everybody to be playing nicely together. Well, and you want acidity to cut through the fat too. Yeah. Because again, we've got, we've got a lot of fat and that's a good thing yeah. and that's what we want, but you don't want... Like at, like at a really good dinner party. You don't want one voice at the table drowning out everybody else. It's annoying. <laughs> yeah, that bro can go home. I mean, this is the thing. is So tannins, which are the chewy thing in red wine, tannins are something that do have powerful interactions with food. So, for example, tannins in our pasta, if we had tannins in the Cote d'Aron, and Cote d'Aron does not have a ton of tannins, but tannins will make spicy food spicier. Okay. If we wanted to make it spicier, we could go with something much more tannic, like a Bordeaux. I think the Cote d'Aron is really good. It does have some tannins, but it's not going to be very tannic. It's probably not going to make that pasta spicier. It'll it'll keep it even. Whereas the white, a Chablis, would make the pasta feel less spicy. And bitterness in cheese, and you don't often think of cheese as being bitter, but cheese does tend to have like a lot of bitterness and varying degrees depending on what you're having that can bring out the bitterness in whatever you're drinking. So often you'll be drinking something really delicious with your main that matches really well, and then you move on to cheese, and suddenly it's almost like if you've got musical notes or something, like the bitterness in the cheese is suddenly going to make everything sound a little bit off, especially with the bloomies, especially with this brie camembert, like those cheeses tend to mm -hmm. be, I mean, again, I'm with you on like everybody's saying, oh, asparagus, artichokes, whatever. The bloomies can be some of the hardest ones to pair with wine because they do have that rind that has that like mushroomy bitterness to it. Well, 
So for me, there's something like, especially on Brie, something almost chemical. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I, I like it, but that chemical thing can, I think, interact with tannins really badly and can, they just fight and they're not, they don't bring out the best in each other. And so that's why I think for any bloomy cheese, stick with white wine. Totally. And that, that chemical thing, it's literally, it's like ammonia. Yeah. If you get a Brie, that you kind of forgot about and it's been sitting in your cheese drawer for a while and you un- unwrap it, it's going to smell like the bleach under your sink when it's in balance with the rest of the cheese. And like I said, the Shawos is really young. Even most breeze, like the AOP breeze are sold at two months of age. So if you, if you age them too long, that underlying mild chemical thing that you barely even notice because it's like playing well with everything else, that's going to come out and it's going to smell like bleach. So no. you don't want that. And that's okay. <laughs> it's okay with white wine, but it, it definitely doesn't work with the ribs. Totally. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. If I ask you what it's like to be a Parisian writer, what do you imagine? Drinking noisette after noisette in a noisy cafe? Jotting down lines in your bedside journal while your lover fetches you fresh croissant? Stumbling down the streets overflowing with prose and red wine like Hemingway? Well, now's your chance to find out. My name is Jennifer Garrity, and I'm host of the Story Time in Paris podcast. In each episode, I chat with a writer with a French connection. The twist? The questions come from you, the writer's biggest fans and followers. Then our beloved writers will read us an excerpt from their books. So cozy up with a noisette, a croissant, or whatever's your pleasure, and settle in for story time in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. Welcome to Paris Underground Radio's The Heart of You. My name is Annette Delu. This is a podcast about soul exploration, finding out what your true purpose is in this lifetime through various modalities such as grounding in energy clearing, divination and exploring your past lives. Over the next 20 episodes, I will also be interviewing experts in the fields of astrology, mediumship, as well as numerology. Join us every Thursday for a brand new episode. Go to parisundergroundradio.com for more information. And don't forget to follow us on social media at Paris Underground Radio on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I look forward to walking this journey with you. And now, back to Chez Toi. Well, I think we've got the makings of a really convivial, super exciting meal that you can just have on a regular old Wednesday. It's not that difficult or long to pull together. And, and you know, pairing your, your wine and your cheese with this one pot pasta can be a really fun way to just have a big Wednesday night dinner for a crowd. Absolutely. I mean, even a Friday night, you know, can I tell you a Cote de Ron story? Please do. So I got into wine when I was a toddler um, when I was in college. <laughs> and and I, you know, I was like the weird 19-year-old having dinner parties. Oh my God, that was you across the hall. It was me. And so I would have dinner parties. And I remember once I had a dinner party with a group of my friends from college. This is while we were in, in our third year in college. And and they were all like, what should I bring? And they all knew I was really into wine at that point. They're like, oh my God, oh. people still do this. They're like, oh, what should I bring? I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> just bring, I don't care, bring anything. But they all were like, what should I bring? What should I bring? I said, bring Cote de Rhone because it's cheap and it'll be good. Because it is. It's always good. It's never going to suck. I mean, it. hopefully, you know, it's pretty consistent. And and it's always cheap. And um, they all brought Cote de Rhone and it was great. We had this great dinner. And then like 10 years later, I had another dinner party and I invited the same people. This is literally 10 years later. And Everyone shows up with the Cote and I thought it was so weird. I was like, oh my God, this is so weird. You guys all brought the same wine. They're like, Carolyn, you told us 10 years ago to bring Cote de Rhone to dinner parties and I've never brought anything else since then. <laughs> oh my I was God. like, well, great advice. So I'm responsible for a lot of Cote de Rhone and a lot of dinner parties. But it is, if you're going to a party, especially if there's a lot of people there, you don't want to spend a ton of money, right? You don't want to, you don't want to spend... 30 euros on something that 15 people are going to, are going to taste like just bring a coat to Rome. It's easy. Everyone likes it. It goes with a lot of stuff. It's, it's really one of the best. It's fantastic advice. It is funny advice to try and follow here in France where so often they won't 
I don't know how you manage this. If you bring wine to a party, they like won't serve your wine. They'll serve other wine and they'll like save your wine. Oh, it's so weird. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's even more reason to bring something crappy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> to bring something, I'm just kidding. To bring something with a reasonable budget. I get it. Yeah, yeah. We're excited to be pairing everybody's meals with cheeses and wines. Yes. So send us your recipes. Send us some tough ones. I loved thinking about how to pair with spicy food. Can't wait to see what's next. I know. And if anyone has any dinner party wine horror stories, tell us. If you made a faux pas opened up your wine at a dinner party. That'd be pretty funny. Oh, and also share the times that cheese defeated you. I'll tell my, the time that cheese <laughs> defeated me. It was, I was living in Cannes and it was June and it was already hot out and a couple of friends and I decided to go out to a restaurant and kind of like you, we were 19 years old. We thought we were fancy. We put on our fanciest $19 sundresses from Forever 21. And we went down <laughs> to the local fancy restaurant, which was a Swiss restaurant, which makes total sense in Cannes. I don't know why we had a Swiss restaurant. And we got raclette. And raclette, for those of you who haven't had it, I know it's getting trendy in the States, is like a half wheel of Alpine cheese that you hold up against a hot plate and you scrape it off mm. onto potatoes and ham. It's so good. So was this the summer in Cannes? Yeah. <laughs> What? Why would you? This is skiing food. In, in retrospect, it was a big mistake. <laughs> yeah. And here's the problem is I, I like, I, I really like cheese. So I kept eating it long after I should have stopped. And oh, then my friends yeah. decided, again, 19 years old, that they wanted to go out dancing and for cocktails, which I mean, I definitely couldn't do now, but at, after eating a whole <laughs> thing of raclette, I was like, you guys go. I'm going to need to go for a long walk. <laughs> so I had to walk myself yes. home after um, overindulging on raclette in June. But hey, the cheese was worth it. I'm sure the cocktails wouldn't have been. I love raclette, but it is definitely a winter delicacy. It is an apres ski food. After you've exerted yourself yeah. on the slopes, you can eat exactly. some raclette, not when you've been lounging you in the it. sun all day. <laughs> no, exactly. I do have to say that'll be something fun to get back to. There was no skiing this year because of COVID. And I'm sure raclette is not a COVID friendly thing because they have this one wheel of cheese they pass around the restaurant. Oh right? my God. Because yeah. When we talk about Alpine cheeses, these things are like bigger than tires. They're like 120 pounds finished. Like it's it's this Amazing. massive thing that you have to roll around. <laughs> well, because the idea behind them is that you had all the, the Alpine farmers with all their cows and they would take all their milk to one cooperative and be like, make one cheese. We don't have the time or energy to do this. So it's like everybody's milk in one vat. And one massive cheese. And so, yeah, like you say, they're passing the one wheel around the restaurant. Very, un I mean, it's heated, but I still feel like it's not terribly COVID friendly. You know what, though? Team vaccine right Team here. Team vaccine. So I'm, I'm happy. I'm ready to bring back raclette. raclette. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Swetha, for your recipe. Yeah, thank you. And hopefully hear from some of you listeners out there soon. A big thank you to Shwita Manoran for today's recipe. To learn more about the recipe featured today and to see photos of the meal, please go to parisundergroundradio.com. To have your recipe featured in an upcoming episode of Chez Toi, please email us at parisundergroundradio at gmail.com. You can find me, Emily Monaco, at emily underscore in underscore France on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find me, Caroline Connor, at Wine Dine Caroline on all the things. This episode was produced by Paris Underground Radio. The music is A Night Alone by Track Tribe. For more about the Chez Toi podcast and podcasts like it, please go to parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and bon appetit. <laughs>